take it all kinds of ways. Mm. Some people are interested in a particular form of contemporary Japanese art, and they take that back to their own contemporary art, and they just go with it, and that's it. Other people get curious. Where did this come from? Yeah. Why did Ando Tadao decide to just do bare concrete yeah. and not do anything more with it? Where did that idea come from? No one else in the world thought of that. Yeah. Why Japan? And then as soon as you ask that question, then you're getting into what you just talked about, the origin program that we do, yeah. uh, which is to introduce people to the, the origins, the, the kind of um, deeper roots of these things. Yeah. At the modern moment, uh, China is, is booming economically, right? And, in, in it politically, and a political power and military power, in every way that you can think of, China has won the game, and Japan is just nowhere. I mean, this is a, a flat economy. Uh, it's uh, Japan's position in the world, certainly economically, is hugely declined. But in arts, soft power, soft power of Japan reigns supreme, mm. and China's just not a, hardly in the picture. Mm-hmm. When it comes to performing arts, dance, uh, bamboo work, paper work, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, architecture certainly, uh, Japan goes from strength to strength. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think it's be, uh, becoming more, uh, and so a lot of the Westerners and Americans that come here are drawn to that, drawn mm-hmm. to those things. And so I meet people that come here for the pottery, people that come here for the architecture. They just want to go and see Ando Tadao's buildings or something. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's getting very specific. It isn't just Japan, but, uh, you know, I want to see the works of Kengo Kuma. I mean, people come with uh, such very honed down, focused uh, attitudes. I think certainly uh, the appeal of the ordinary is is in ceramics very much. Yeah. Um, these rough surfaced, clunky sort of objects that that only Japan really developed as an art form. Uh, certain things within Japan can really teach you the pleasure of something very basic and simple. It, would it be a point? A point that comes to my mind would be this idea of sort of, of of limits and learning to explore within those limits, and that that limit is almost there for a reason. The thing about limits is that that's how you create art. Every art has limits. With limits, you get art. Without limits, it's what you know. I don't know what you'd call it. Um, and so. If you have a jar and you're putting flowers into it to create a flower arrangement, that fact that you're putting them in that jar is a limitation. Yeah. A sonnet, you know, has a certain number of lines. Uh, that's what creates poetry, rhyme, meter, etc. Of course, there's a lot of free verse, but even there, there's a certain structure to it in that it's not, it's not written like a normal sentence. Mm-hmm. It's clear that it's prosody. So you're never going to get away from that yeah. in any field. And uh, the traditional arts are even more limited, and the greater the limitation, very often, the deeper the art has to go. Right. Um, which is why no drama, which is the most limited of, of them all, is the most profound, uh, the most uh, spiritual. But somehow it's as if the limits are forcing you downwards uh, rather than up and out. Down, what do you mean by downwards? Down, into, into spiritual depths. Could could you elaborate on that a little bit? The the spirit. What uh, what well, spirituality? Well, I mean, the, these words right behind me is a yugen, uh, which is a term from no drama, uh, which means you. Again, means darkness. You means uh, deep. Mm-hmm. So deep darkness. Uh, and so yugen, which is which is the a aesthetic term uh, in no drama uh, means something that you can't see, that's something that's mysterious beyond the veil but is ineffably beautiful, uh, which of course is the that kind of epiphany of, of the incredible reality beyond the normal reality that we see. 
which is what you're supposed to get through meditation. Uh, it's, uh, it's that kind of Zen Satori. It's the Shinto gods that are beyond the, you know, the veil. All of that is Yugen. And that's what the no drama performer is supposed to create. So after you've watched this incredibly slow movement for some time, this thing starts to come through. Uh, and that's what they're aiming at. You can go to some of the places that I talk about, actually, in uh, another Kyoto that are not on that uh, big tour route. Uh, you can come here. Um, in a place like this, uh, Kyoto is here. The real Kyoto is here. And not just my house, but there are other people that live this way. Uh, so you can uh, maybe go out and visit a potter. There are these really interesting artists right here in Kamioka and in the outskirts of uh, northern part of Kyoto and uh, eastern part of Kyoto. Uh, there are people that live a certain kind of life and, and having friends come and visit and, uh, and enjoying the season and, and the artworks and talking of this and that and, and uh, living with the seasons. That, that, that was something that the Chinese valued. They really created that ideal, and it came into Japan. And yeah. it it's still exists. It's very strong. But you, it's, you need to kind of find those places and those people. Japan's going the other direction, really, which is just uh, sickly, perhaps, but uh, uh, um, uh, plastic. Live in your plastic box. But No and Kabuki have a kind of outer ring of experimental work. But the core remains highly traditional and mm -hmm. is not especially changing, right. except in, in rather modest ways. Right. Uh, so what's happened is, uh, it's almost as if uh, it's like, um, I wish I could find the right metaphor, that experimental stuff around the edges draws people in, mm -hmm. and then the next thing they know, they've, they've entered the, the, you know, the black hole of the actual... <laughs> right. They've gone beyond the event horizon, and now they're in the actual core of the old art form. Uh, but it gets them interested. My personal experience was almost the reverse, yeah. in that my interest was in that deep, dark core, right from the beginning. And so I had an interest in history, and I had an interest in in culture and art, and the, the people that I was lucky enough to know uh, taught me from that perspective. And uh, starting from that, I then went out and saw this experimental stuff being done and thought, oh, that's really interesting. Right. So I kind of went the other way. I don't think in the old days I was trying to show anybody anything. Mm. I just loved these places yeah. and wanted to live that way. I mean, it was, it was really as simple as that. Um, but uh, on the subject of paradigm breaking, yeah. um, and, and limitation versus experimentation and all of that. Yeah. Um, my kind of take on it is, you know, you have, for example, a traditional art, yeah. such as no drama or tea ceremony, uh, or Japanese painting, or many, many other things. And then you go out and you experiment and you do these things, but then eventually you're going to run dry. You need to go back to the well, and uh, that deep spiritual well, and, and, and reach back in there again. Yeah. And that's called uh, back to the, I call it back to the origin. And, and if you go back to that origin and then strip away all the other junk that's accreted over the, in the meantime, yeah. you're going to find something that's incredibly relevant to what you want to do now. Yeah. And one of the problems that we do have in Japanese arts is, I've just said that those institutions have been very successful in maintaining them. Yeah. Well, the minus, the downside of that is that it gets... Uh, arteriosclerosis, you know, they get fixed and set and ossified, ossified and, and just absolutely incapable of new ideas. Yeah. And, and also the rules and regulations that pile up, many of them came much later, are not found in the original thing. For example, you, if you read some of the manuals of yeah. flower arranging, yeah. it's unbelievable. This has to be at 27 degrees and this should be at 82 yeah. degrees. Well, that's completely runs against the true spirit yeah. of flower arranging. So to be a great flower arranger, you've actually got to shatter, smash, get rid of those latter-day rules. Yeah. 
And that's where you need to think deeply about it and say, what is really great about flower arranging and what is just a latter-day rule that I can do away with? And so that's where it gets interesting. The really creative ones, yeah. that's what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and, and how do you do that? It's by loving and going deeply into that, getting back to that origin and understanding it. Yeah. And, and, when, and when you do understand it, then you can come back out again and you get it. You know what you can do away with. And so that's where the, the people like Kawase Toshiro, the great modern flower arranger, that's where he's achieved his masterpieces mm. because he, he went back to the origin. And There's a word they're using nowadays, by the way, UNESCO side. Oh my God! <laughs> uh, because as soon as something <laughs> is declared uh, world right. heritage, then yeah. it's doomed. Because the tour buses will come. Yeah. Uh, you get the fixed tour. Uh, you get the fixed idea of what it stands for. Yeah. The whole thing freezes, and and it becomes practically a place you never want to go to again. You know, Japan for for really until pretty recently was not on China's horizon. Sure. Culturally. Sure. Uh, I mean, I think your average Chinese just thought of Japan as, as an island in the sea, and China was everything. Sure. Well, they come here, and suddenly they realize, wait a minute, we, I'm talking about mainland China, after the Cultural Revolution, we lost everything. We don't have Buddhism. We don't have, I mean, we have this kind of faked up stuff, but the real Buddhism is practically gone. We don't have faith. We don't have artists who are, do nothing except devote themselves to their art for art's sake. Uh, because it's all so commercialized in China, right? We're, we've lost, even you go to uh, Jing De Zhen, you know, the great pottery center, the techniques, those incredible techniques are largely lost as it gets all mass produced. So they come to Japan and it's like, oh my God, there are people still, you know, doing, the, making pots in old rising uh, kilns. Uh, there's still tea ceremony institutions. There's still Zen monks who really believe in Zen and really meditate. You know, there's still esoteric Buddhist centers where esoteric Buddhism lives on, yeah. and they know what the meaning of it is. They see that. That's a shock. And uh, now the 99% of them are just here to wear their, you know, uh, faux kimono and take some selfies. But there is that 1% for whom it's, it's, it's an eye-opener. <laughs> Sure. And 1% yeah. of, is a, of, of the number of people that are yeah. coming is a <laughs> that's lot of... That's why I was is, laughing. Yeah, that's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. That is a lot of people. Yeah. And so that, I think, has had quite an impact. Mm -hmm. And, and it's going to be more and more. Mm -hmm.